There's a room to come up here if you would. Um, Jennifer Bester, Laura Bradley, Ted Lambert, and Dennis Cook. Dennis? So I, I'm a mom in a basic aid district. It's Menlo Park in Atherton. Uh, I won't say my neighbors include Jerry Rice, Meg Whitman, Charles Schwab, but certainly fellow property owners in that district include those people. And so I got puzzled about why per student spending was starting to fall. I have read many years ago, five, seven years ago, that commercial property was getting a much better deal out of Prop 13 than residential. So I started to research it, and every time I researched it, I, I, I could see how this was happening. I could see individual properties that seemed to be getting a good deal. But whenever I talked about it to people who were uh, Republican or rich or powerful, they always had arguments that they came back and at me with that sounded like pretty good arguments. So finally I decided that I was just going to do the whole thing. And I went and I bought the assessment rolls for my entire uh, district. I bought the rolls for 2009, which was the current year and 1985, which was the, the earliest one that they had, and analyzed what the, what, the, uh, what the difference had been. And what I found was that for commercial property in Menlo Park, we got one we got to turn off, yeah. Um, originally, we, uh, commercial property was paying about 20% of the total. And in the years between 1985 and 2009, it had fallen to 9%. How did that happen? That happened in two ways. If we can take that difference, I, I can divide it in half. Half of it was what I'll call exogenous factors. So the value of the homeowner's exemption has fallen in all those years. Uh, the $7,000 was worth a lot more when uh, $100,000 was the average price of a home than it's worth now at a million. Um, there has been conversion of uh, residential or exempt property, like our seminary, turned into uh, just houses. So there were half of it was that. The other half of it was the fact that commercial property doesn't have to turn over in terms of the property owner of record as frequently as res residential so does. I, I sell my house. Gets reassessed. The whole thing. You you sell your house. It gets reassessed. How does a business get around that? On, they don't, they don't necessarily have to get around it. So give me a moment, Tom. I'll get there. I really will. Um, they can get around it by putting things into partnerships and selling shares of the partnership at different times. If more than 50% doesn't change hands, then technically it's not a change of ownership. They can put it into different kinds of limited liability corporations and things like that and get around it that way. But they can also get around it right out in the open through Prop 58. Now, many of you were around in 1986 when Prop 58 was passed. Logically, what it did was allow uh, parents who had helped their children buy a home, the parents could die, and the children's home price wasn't reassessed. But there was there were some subclauses in that, and one said that up to a million dollars in assessed value of property could be handed from parent to child without a reassessment. So the net, the net effect of all of this has been um, that commercial property has been paying an ever smaller percentage of the total and that there are now very significant discrepancies, just as there are between homeowners, there are very significant discrepancies between commercial property owners. Give me an example. The first one that comes to mind is dry cleaning establishments in Menlo Park. We have one that's that's in half of a building that's paying $1,844. Actually, it's probably down to $1,800 this year. Um, so that would be $900. We have another one down the street that's uh, occupying the ground floor of a building that's paying $45,000. So we've got $23,000 $23, versus $900. And what it's meant has been a shift of the burden of local property taxes to homeowners from commercial property. Are schools getting less because of this? Depends how you want to define it. If it had, if commercial property had appreciated, if if it had appreciated or at the same rate as residential, 
yes, there would probably be about 5% more. Now that's just saying at the same rate as Prop 13 tamped down residential. It would probably be about 5%. More. You need more money, and so I think what we should be focusing on is how do we get more money in the system, and the only way you do that is through a broad-based tax. Conceivably, it could be property tougher, or income, our income tax is a lot lower than it was just two years ago, but that's how you bring the interest groups together. So I think if we're talking about more money, let's figure out a viable way to do it. I think there are some that we could get done by so 2012. You're, you're saying we need higher taxes? I sure am. You're, you're not running for governor. Yeah. No, I, actually, uh, again, it, uh, let's get back to interest groups. Pete Wilson and Gray Davis mm -hmm. both supported Prop 39 against Jarvis Bay. Uh, and so absolutely, if you talk about higher taxes for government, you're dead. If you talk about higher act taxes for just education, which we rarely ever do, you, you can do it. And I would expect Governor Whitman or Governor Brown to support that when it goes on the ballot. I'm here representing Accomplished California Teachers, which is an organization that started just a couple years ago. And the conversation was started with how do we get the teacher's voice heard in policy decisions? Because there's plenty of research that will tell you that teachers can be the most critical aspect of a child's education. Um, and what Accomplished California Teachers did was to prepare a policy report on recommendations for a better system to evaluate teachers. Because the current system for evaluating teachers is really pretty much a checklist. So, but wait a minute, so mm -hmm. the myths were in. Yes. You're saying if we just did a better job of evaluating teachers, well, getting out of this mess? The purpose for evaluating them would be to help them improve. Currently, so is part of the mess we're in is that the teachers are not good enough? No, 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 no. Part of the mess we're in is that no one is looking at differences in teaching. You're a teacher or you're not a teacher, and there is, as teachers are evaluated, which happens on a regular system, um, it is simply, yes, you are still a teacher and your students are sitting in the classroom and no one is throwing paper airplanes. Yeah, but, but by way of context, there's a report called the widget effect, which indicates that across the country, 97% of our teachers are rated as satisfactory or better. Absurd on its face, but the evaluation system where the principal sits in the back of the room without the checklist. So, a concern is that voices that we're hearing outside of the classroom are saying the problem, the mess, is due to teachers. They're bad teachers. Bad if teachers we could just get right rid of the bad, bad teachers, yeah. then we would be fine. And what it ignores is what makes for an effective teacher. How do we know when a teacher is effective? And uh, the push to say, well, a student test scores determines teacher quality is missing so much of what goes into, first of all, what makes them a good teacher, and secondly, how we know that the students are learning. Well, there are test scores count? Test mm -hmm. scores need to be considered as part of a much bigger package. But we need to remember that they occur on one day. And I need to speak as an English teacher, um, almost 20 years teaching junior high English. The bulk of my curriculum is writing. And I don't think anyone would argue that my students need to write. They need to write a lot. And writing skills are critical to their academic success. They are tested with a multiple choice test. And, and there one, are one actually... Of the, one of the questions is, writing is important, yes? <laughs> actually, I'm, uh, well, I, I, legally I am not allowed to look at the test, so I have no idea what's on it. I just know that it's multiple choice. So my students create multiple works written works, published works, all throughout the year, and I would be judged on a multiple choice test, which does not accurately show what I've done or what they've done. Yeah. So do you have a number of silver BBs? Uh, I have a number of silver BBs, but I'll, I'll keep them in reserve for the moment and, and really give you the big picture of it, which I think is, is that the, the debate about how to get out of this mess tends to polarize around two positions, and one is we need more money. And that's certainly true. We do need more money. And uh, the previous speaker mentioned getting down to facts. Getting down to facts estimated that we needed about 15 to 20 percent more money in or in 2007. And we've since cut spending in California by about 20 percent. So we need substantially more than that. And the other pole of this conversation is well, we need to radically change the way we do education. And that's also true. And the 
approach that Getting Down to Facts took and that the Governor's Committee on Education Excellence took as a consequence of Getting Down to Facts was we can't do one without the other. That California voters simply won't vote to give more money to schools without seeing dramatic changes in the way the school system is organized. Uh, but the interest groups that Ted talked about, and we could name them if you like. Yeah, go uh, ahead. Well, the, the teachers' unions, the administrators' organizations, uh, the school boards' association, and so on, uh, will not uh, move forward on substantial reform unless the wheels are greased by additional resources. Show us the money, and then we'll do something. Or the government well, saying, and, the, and so the the, the 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 trick, I think, as as you, as you well know, John, is, is is how to get those two things to happen simultaneously. We can't have a plan of action tonight on one piece. And the piece is the state, which is sort of the, the focus of your area. And because once we solve that piece, there's a ton of work to do, a ton of work locally. Because if we do our job right, there will be more money and more reform. And that reform will lead to significant local flexibility. And so there's going to be a, a, an extraordinary amount of work to do in each local community. Can you get the interest groups to do it? The, uh, Children Now, the School Boards Association, PTA. We did an interview project uh, a few years ago where we talked to each of these major interest groups in the state behind closed doors. When you talk to them behind closed doors, we are so much closer than you think, which is why I am optimistic, but I don't think the California Teachers Association or the Chamber of Commerce, and I think those are the two interests to talk about, they're the two most powerful. If you ask the Teachers Association, they might say it tonight, they say, there's no way that disgusting Chamber of Commerce said against sports telling. If you ask the Chamber of Commerce folks, they'll say, we're never gonna do anything with the Teachers Association. I actually think you can get them together. We have before, and if we all demand it, if we get those two groups together, um, the public will support reform and revenue to do pretty close to what, to solve the state problem. And so the state problem is not enough money, over regulation, we have the third most categoricals of the 50 states. We put barriers to effective teaching and we put barriers to the kind of evaluation that was talked about. Um, and so I think getting down to facts laid out a plan. We spent millions on research on what should be done. And I think some other states like Maryland and others have pointed it past. So deregulate, more money and remove the barriers. Can you get out of this mess without some blood on the floor? That's a metaphor, not a really, really. <laughs> Well, I just say absolutely not. I mean, you, 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 for the State Chamber of Commerce to vote to support a tax increase is blood on the floor. And for Government Teacher Association to remove some of the barriers that protect some of their members is blood on the floor. So there absolutely needs blood on the floor, and I think that's what we all have to demand. And, you know, are, are you guys ready for that? Uh, uh, I, I will invite all of you, I mean, I, I, I wonder myself whether, even if you guys are ready for it, you, know, you only represent maybe 20% of households. Um, and I, I'm not sure, I've never heard school people with an effective strategy for bringing in the other 80% who do not have school-age children. Because we will keep it oh, we get up to 32% or some number. I made that number up. But um, do you have, is that, does that have to be part of it? Do you have to somehow demonstrate, I and mean, I don't have any school age children. I'm sure there are other people. I still don't have any school age children now. How do you get us to care about other people's children? That may be part of the problem. I don't care. I would just say, I, I'm not trying to underestimate the challenges we have with the public, but I, I think that's the least of our problems. If you look at a lot of public in, opinion polling, the public's ahead of the political elite. Yes, the public, where the last place you should cut in the budget, they say education. What took the greatest cuts in the last few years? Education. So the public's a challenge, but I really argue with folks who say we need to you know, educate the public to do this grounds up movement. No, what's, what's stopping the progress are the, the political elite.